This is the story of the giraffe and the Pelly and me. Not far from where I live, there is a queer old empty wooden house standing all by itself on the side of the road. I long to explore inside it, but the door is always locked. And when I peer through a window, all I can see is darkness and dust. I know the ground floor used once to be a shop because I can still read the faded lettering across the front which says the grubber. My mother has told me in our part of the country in the olden days a grubber was another name for a sweet shop. And now every time I look at it, I think to myself, what a lovely old sweet shop it must have been. On the shop window itself, somebody had painted in white the words, for sale. One morning, I noticed that for sale, had been scraped off the shop window and in its place somebody had painted sold. I stood there staring at the new writing, wishing like mad that it had been me who had bought it. Because then I would have been able to make it into a rubber all over again. I have always longed and longed to own a sweet shop. The sweet shops of my dreams would be loaded from top to bottom with sherbet suckers and caramel fudge and Russian toffee and sugar snorters and butter gumballs and thousands and thousands of other glorious things like that. Oh boy, what I couldn't have done with that old grubber shop if it had been mine. On my next visit to the grubber, I was standing across the road gazing at the wonderful old building when suddenly an enormous bathtub came sailing out through one of the second floor windows and crashed right onto the middle of the road. A few moments later a white porcelain lavatory pan with the wooden seat still on it, came flying out of the same window and landed with a, a wonderful splintering crash just beside the bathtub. This was followed by a kitchen sink and an empty canary cage and four poster bed and two hot water bottles, and a rocking horse, and a sewing machine, and goodness knows what else besides. It looked as though some madman was ripping out the whole of the inside of the house, because now pieces of staircase and bits of banisters, and a whole lot of old floorboards came whistling through one of the win windows. Then there was silence. I waited and waited, but not another sound came from within the building. I crossed the road and stood right under the windows 
and called out, Is anybody home? There was no answer. In the end, it began to get dark, so I had to turn away and start walking home. But you can bet your life, nothing was going to stop me from heading back there again tomorrow morning to see what on earth was, what, no, what the next surprise was going to be. When I got back there, back to the grabber house, the next morning, the first thing I noticed was the door. The dirty old brown door had been taken out and in its place someone had fitted a brand new red door, a brand new red one. The new door was fantastic. It was twice as high as the other one had been, and it looked ridiculous. I couldn't begin to imagine who would want a tremendously tall door, a tremendous tall door like that in his house unless it was a giant. As well as this, somebody had scraped away the sold notice on the shop window and now there was a whole lot of different writing all over the glass. I stood there reading it and reading it and trying to figure out what on earth it all meant. The Ladderless Window Cleaning Company get your windows cleaned without a lot of dirty ladders leaning against your house. I tried to catch some sign or sound of movement inside the house but there was none until all of a sudden out of the corner of my eye, I noticed one of the windows on the top floor was slowly beginning to open outwards. Then a head appeared at the open window. I stared at the head. The head stared back at me with big round dark eyes. Suddenly, a second window was flung wide open and of all the crazy things, a gigantic white bird hopped out and perched on the windowsill. I knew what this one was because of its amazing beak which was shaped like a huge orange colored basin. The pelican looked down at me and sung out, Oh how I wish for a big fat fish, I'm as hungry as ever could be. A dish of fish is my only wish. How far are we from the sea? We are a long way from the sea, I called back to him. But there is a fishmonger in the village, not far away. A fish what? A fishmonger. Now what on earth could that be? The pelican asked the pelican. I have heard of a fish pie, a fish cake and a fish finger, but I have never heard of a fishmonger. Are these monger good to eat? This question baffled me a bit, so I said, Who is your friend?
friend in the next window. She is the giraffe, the pelican answered. Isn't, is she not wonderful? Her legs are on the ground floor and her head is looking out of the top window. As if all this wasn't enough, the window on the first floor was now flung wide open and out popped a monkey. The, mon the monkey stood on the windowsill and did a jiggly little dance. He was so skinny, he seemed to be made only out of furry bits of wire, but he danced wonderfully well. And I, and I clapped and cheered and did a little dance myself in return. We are the window cleaners, sang out the monkey. We will polish your glass till it's shining like brass and it sparkles like sun on the sea. We are quick and polite, we will come day or night, the giraffe and the pally and me. We're a fabulous crew, we know just what to do and we never stop work to drink tea. All your windows will glow when we give them a go, the giraffe and the pally and me. We use water and soap plus some kindness and hope, but we never use ladders not to we. Who needs ladders at all when you're 30 feet tall? Not giraffe, not pally and not me. I stood there enthralled. Then I heard a giraffe saying to the pelican in the next window, Pally, my dear, be so good as to fly down and bring that small person up here to talk to us. At once the pelican spread his huge white wings and flew down onto the road beside me. Hop in, he said, opening, opening his enormous beak. I stared at the great orange beak and backed away. Go on, the monkey shouted from up in his window. The pally isn't going to swallow you. Climb in. I said to the pelican, I'll only get in if you promise not to shut your beak once I'm inside. You have nothing to fear, cried the pelican. And let me tell you why. I have a very special beak. A special beak have I. You'll never see a beak so fine. I don't care where you go. There's magic in this beak of mine. Hop in and don't say no. I will not hop in, I said. Unless you swear on your honour you won't shut it once I'm inside. I don't like small dark places. When I have done what I'm just about to do, said the pelican, I won't be able to shut it. You don't seem to understand how my beak works. Show me, I said. Watch this, cried the pelican. I watched in amazement. As the top half of the pelican's beak began to slide smoothly backwards into his head until the whole thing was almost out of sight. It bends and goes down the back it bends and goes down inside the back of my neck, cried the pelican. Is that not sensible? Is that not magical? It's unbelievable, I said. It's exactly like one of those tape measures my father's got at home.
When it's out, it's straight. When you fly it back in, it bends and disappears. Precisely, said the pelican. You see, the top half is of no use to me unless I'm chewing fish. The bottom half is what counts, my lad. The bottom half is of wait. The bottom half of this glorious beak of mine is the bucket in which we carry our window cleaning water. So if I didn't have to slide the top half away, I'd be standing around all day holding it open. So I slide it away for the rest of the day even though I'm still able to talk. And wherever I've flown, it's, it has always been known that it's as the pelican's pattern to its beak. If I want to eat fish, that's my favourite dish. All I do is give it a tweak. In the blink of an eye, out pops and they cry. It's the pelican's pattern to its beak. shouted the monkey from upstairs window. Hurry up and bring that small person up to us. The giraffe is waiting. I climbed into the big orange beak and with a whoosh, swoosh of wings, of wings, the pelican carried me back onto his perch on the window sill. The giraffe looked out of her windows, window at me and said, How do you do? What is your name? Billy, I told her. Well, Billy, she said, we need your help and we need it fast. We must have some windows to clean. We've spent every penny we have on buying this house and we must earn some more money quickly. The pelly is starving, the monkey is famished, and I am perishing with hunger. The pelly needs nuts, the mon the, the pelly needs fish, the monkey needs nuts, and I am even more difficult to feed. I am a geranius giraffe. And a geranius giraffe can't eat anything except the pink and purple flowers of the tinkle tinkle tree. But those, I think, I'm sure you know, are hard to find and expensive to buy. The pelican cried out, Right now I am so hungry I could eat a stale sarin. Has anyone seen a stale sarin or a bucket of raw cod? I've eaten the whole lot upon the spot. I'm such a hungry bard. Every time the pelican spoke, the beak I was standing in jiggled madly up and down. The more and the more excited he got, the more it jiggled. The monkey said, what Pelly's really crazy about is salmon. Yes, yes, cried the pelican. Salmon, oh glorious salmon. I dreamed about it all day long, but I never get any. And I dreamed about walnuts, shouted the monkey. A walnut fresh from the tree is scrumptious, glumptious, so flavoury, savoury, so sweet to eat that it makes me all wobbly just thinking about it. At exactly that moment, a huge white Royals Royce pulled up right below us and a chauffeur in a blue and gold uniform got out. He was carrying an envelope in one gloved hand. Good heavens, I whispered. That's 
the Duke of Hampshire's car. Who was he? asked the giraffe. He's the richest man in England, I said. The chauffeur knocks on the door of the grubber. He looked up and saw us. He saw the giraffe, the pelly, the monkey and me all staring down at him from above. But not a muscle moved on his face. Not an eyebrow was raised. The, the chauffeurs of very rich men are never surprised by anything they see. The chauffeur said, His Grace the Duke of Hampshire has instructed me to deliver this envelope to the ladderless window cleaning company. That's us! cried the monkey. The giraffe said, Be so good as to open the envelope and read it to us. Read the letter to us. The chauffeur unfolded the letter and began to read. Dear sirs, I saw your notice on, as I drove by this morning. I have been looking for a decent window cleaner for the last 50 years, but I have not found one yet. My house has 677 windows in it, not counting the greenhouse, and all of them are filthy. Kindly come and see me as soon as possible. Yours truly, Hemshire. That added to the chauffeur in a voice filled with awe and respect was written by His Grace the Duke of Hemshire in his own hand. The giraffe said to the chauffeur, Please tell His Grace the Duke of Hemshire the Duke that we will be with him as soon as possible. The chauffeur touched his cap and got back into the Rolls Royce. Whoopee! shouted the monkey. Fantastic! cried the pelican. That must be the best window cleaning job in the world. Billy, said the giraffe, what is, that, what is the house called and how do we get there? It is called Hampshire's house, I said. It's just over the hill. I'll show you the way. The way. We're off! cried the monkey. We're, up, we're off to see the duke. The giraffe stooped low and went through the tall door. The monkey jumped off the windowsill onto the giraffe's back. The pelican with me in his beak, hanging on for dear life, flew across and perched on the very top of the giraffe's head. And away we went. It wasn't long before we came to the great gates of Hampshire's house. And as, we, and as the giraffe moved slowly up the great wide driveway, we all began to just to, to feel just a little bit nervous. That what's this what's he like, this duke? the giraffe asked. I don't know, I said, but he's very, very fabulous and very rich. People say he has 25 gardeners just to look after his flower 
bags. Soon the huge house itself came into view. And what a house it was! It was like a palace. It was bigger than a palace. Just look at those windows, cried the monkey. They'll keep us going forever. Then suddenly we heard a man's voice a short distance away to the right. I wasn't, I was, I wasn't, I, I want those big black ones at the top of the tree, the man was shouting. Get me those great big black ones. We peered around the bushes and saw an oldish man with an immense white moustache standing under a tall cherry tree and pointing his walking stick in the air. Get. There was another, there was a ladder against the tree and another man who was probably a gardener was up the ladder. Get me those great, big, juicy ones right at the very top, the old man was shouting. I can't reach them, your grace, the gardener called back. The ladder isn't long enough. Damnations, shouted the duke. I was so looking forward to eating those big ones. Here we go, the pelican whispered to me. And with a swish and swoop, he carried me up to the very top of the cherry tree and there he perched. Pick them, Billy, he whispered. He whispered, pick them, pick them, quick, wait, um, pick them quickly and put them in my beak. The gardener got such a shock, he fell off the ladder. Down below us, the duke was shouting, my gun, get me my gun, some damnable bird. Monster of a bird is stealing my best cherries. Be off with you, sir. Go away. Those are my cherries, not yours. I'll have you shot for this, sir. Where is my gun? Hurry, Billy, whispered the pelican. Hurry, hurry, hurry! My gun! The duke was shouting to the gardener. Get me my gun, you idiot! I'll have that thieving bird for breakfast. You see if I don't. I've picked them all, I whispered to the pelican. At once the pelly flew down right beside the furious figure Duke of Hampshire, who was sprinting about his walking stick in the air. Your cherries, your grace, I said, as I leaned over the edge of the pelican's beak and offered a handful to the Duke. The Duke was staggered. He reeled back and his eyes nearly popped out of their sockets. Good Scott! He gasped. Great Lord, what's this? Who are you? And now the giraffe with the monkey dancing about on her back emerged suddenly from the bushes. 
the duke, the duke's star, the duke stared at them. He looked as though he was about to have a fit. Who are these creatures? He bellowed. Has the whole world gone completely dotty? We are the window cleaners, sang out the monkey. We will polish your glass till it's shining like glass, glass, brass, and it sparkles like sun on the sea. We will work for your grace till we're blue in the face. The giraffe and the pally and me. You asked us to come, you see, the giraffe said. The truth was at last beginning to draw on the duke, to down on the duke. He, he put a cherry into his mouth and chewed it slowly. Then he spat out the stone. I like the way you picked these cherries for me. He he said, could you also pick my apples in the autumn? We could, we could, of course we could. We all shouted. Who are, and who are you? The Duke said, pointing his stick at me. He is our business manager, the giraffe said. He nay, his name is Billy. We go nowhere without him. Very well, very well, the duke, the duke muttered. Come, come along with me. And let's see if you, you are any good at cleaning windows. I climbed out of the pelican's beak, and the kind and the kindly old duke took me by the hand as we all walked towards the house. When we got there, the duke said. What happens next? It's all very simple, your grace, the giraffe replied. I am the ladder, the pelly is the bucket, and the monkey is the cleaner. Watch us go! With, with that, the the famous window cleaning gang sprang into action. The monkey jumped down from the giraffe's back and turned on the, the garden tap. The, pelly, the pelican held his great beak under the tap until it was full of water. Then, with a wonderful splintering leap, the monkey leapt, leap, leap, leaped one up once again on the giraffe's back. From there, he scrambled as easily as if he was climbing a tree up the long, long neck of the giraffe until he he stood balancing on the very top of her head. Oh. On the top of her head. The pelican rem 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 the pelican remained standing on the ground beside us looking up at the giraffe. We'll do the top floor first, the giraffe shouted down. Bring the water up, please. The duke called out. D 
Don't worry about the two top floors. You can't reach them anyway. Who says we can't reach them? The giraffe called back. I do, the duke said firmly. And I'm not having any of your, you risking your silly necks around here. If you wish to be friends with the giraffe, Never say anything bad about its neck. Its neck is its proudest pole position. What's wrong with my neck? Snapped the giraffe. Don't argue with me, you foolish creature. The duke said, cried the duke. If you can't reach it, you can't reach it, and that's the end of it. Now get on with your work. Oh. Your grace, the giraffe said, giving a giving the duke a small superior smile. There are no windows in the world I can't reach with this magical neck of mine. The monkey who is dancing about most dangerously on the top of the giraffe's head cried out. Show him, giraffe Go on, show him how you're... How... Show him, giraffe What? Where am I trying? Go on, show him what you can do with your magical neck. The next moment, the giraffe's neck, which heaven knows how long enough, already began to grow longer and longer and longer and longer and higher and higher and higher. Until at last the giraffe's head with the monkey on top of its if it's one of its way last level with the windows of the top floor of the giraffe the top floor the giraffe looked down from here, from her height, her great height, and said to the duke, how was that? The duke was speechless, and so was I. It was the most, it was the most magical thing I have ever seen, I had ever seen. More magical than the pal than even the pelican's patented beak. Up above us, the giraffe was beginning to sing a little song, but she sang it softly, so I could hardly catch the words. I think it went something like this. My neck can stretch terribly high, much higher than the eagles can fly. If I ventured to show how high, just how high it could go, you'd lose the sight of my head in the sky. The pelican, with his huge beak full of water, flew up and perched on one of the top floor window sills near the monkey and now the great window cleaning business really began. The speed with which the t team worked as, a, as astonishing was astonishing.
As soon as one window was done, the giraffe moved the monkey over to the next one and the pelican followed. When all the fourth floor windows on that side of the house were finished, the giraffe simply drew in her magical neck until the monkey was level with the third floor windows and off they went again. Amazing! cried the Duke. Astonishing! Remarkable! Incredible! I have never seen out of any of my windows for 40 years. Now I shall be able to sit indoors and enjoy the view. Suddenly, suddenly I saw all three of the window cleaners, cleaners stop dead in their tracks. They seemed to freeze against the wall of the house. None of them moved. What's happened to them? The Duke asked me. What's gone wrong? I don't know, I answered. The giraffe with the monkey on her head tiptoed very gingerly away from the house and came towards us. The pelican flew with them. The giraffe came up very close to the duke and whispered, Your Grace, there is a man on one of the bed in one of the bedrooms on the third floor. He is opening all of the drawers and taking everything out. He has got a pistol. The Duke jumped about 40 feet in the air. Which room? He, he snapped. Show me at once. It's the one on the third floor where the window is wide open. The giraffe whispered. By gad! By gad! cried the Duke. That's the Duchess's bedroom. He's after the jewels. Call the police. Summon the army. Bring up the cannon. Charge charmed with delight, Brigade. But even as he spoke, the pelican f was flying up into the air. As he flew, he turned himself upside down and tipped the window cleaning water out of his beak. Then I saw the top half of the pelican, the marvelous patterned his beak, slide out of his head, re ready for action. What's that crazy bird up to? cried the dude. Wait and see, shouted the monkey. Hold your breath, old man. Hold your nose. Hold your horses and watch the penny go. Like a bullet, the pelican flew through the open window and five seconds later, and five seconds later, out he came again with his or great orange beak firmly closed. He landed on the lounge, on the lounge beside the duke. A tremendous banging noise was coming from the from inside the pelican's beak. It sounded as 
as though someone was using a sledgehammer against it from the inside. He's got him! cried the monkey. Pelly's got the burglar in his beak! Well done, sir! shouted the duke, hopping about with excitement. Suddenly, he pulled handle of his walking stick upwards and out the hollow inside of the stick itself. He drew a long, thin, sharp, shining sword. I'm running through, he shouted, flourish, flourishing his sword like a fencer, like a fencer. Open up, Pelican, let me get at him. I'll run, I'll run the bounder through before he knows what happens to him. I'll spike him like a pat of butter. I'll feed his gizzards to my foxhounds. But the pelican did not open his beak. He kept it firmly closed and shook his head again at the duke. The giraffe shouted, The burglar is armed with a pistol, your grace. If Pelly lets him out now, he'll, he'll shoot us all. He can be armed with a match gun for all I care, bellowed the duke. His, his massive moustache bristled like brushwood. I'll handle the brighter, I'll handle the blighter. Open up, sir, open up. Suddenly there was an enormous, there was an air splintering bang. And the pelican leaped, leapt 20 feet into the air. So did the duke. Watch out! The duke shouted, taking ten rapid paces backwards. He's trying to shoot his way out and pointing his sword at the pelican, he bellowed. Keep that beak closed, keep that beak closed, sir! Don't you dare let him out, or he'll murder us all. Shake him up, Pally, cried the giraffe. Rattle his bones, teach him not to do that again. The pelican shook his head so fast from side to side that the beak became a blur and the man inside must have felt like he was being scrambled like eggs. Well done, Pally! cried the giraffe. You're doing a great job. Keep on shaking him so he doesn't fire that pistol again. At this point, a lady with an enormous chest and flaming orange hair came flying out of the house, screaming, My jewels! Somebody's stolen my jewels! My diamond tiara! My diamond necklace! My diamond bracelets! My diamond earrings! My diamond rings! They've had the lot! My room has been ransacked! And then, this massive female, who 55 years ago had been a world-famous opera singer, suddenly burst into song. My diamonds are over the ocean. My diamonds are over the sea. My diamonds were pinched from my bedroom. 
Oh, bring back my diamonds to me. We were so bowled over by the power of the lady's lungs that all of us, excepting the pelican who had to keep his beak closed, joined in the chorus. Bring back, bring back, oh, bring back my diamonds to me, to me. Bring back, bring back, oh, bring back my diamonds to me. Calm yourself, Henrietta, said the duke. He pointed to the pelican and said, This clever bird, this brilliant burglar catching creature has saved the day. The bounders in his beak. The Duchess stared at the pelican. The pelican stared back at the Duchess and gave her a wink. If he's in there, cried the Duchess, why don't you let him out? Then you can run him through with that famous sword of yours. I want my diamonds. Open your beak, bird. No, no, shouted the duke. He's got a pistol. He'll murder us all. Someone must have called the police because no less. Then four squad cars came racing towards us with their sirens screaming. Within seconds we were surrounded by six policemen and the Duke was shouting to them, The villain you are after is inside the beak of that bird. Stand by to collar him. And... To the, and to the pelican, he said, get ready to open up. Are you ready? Steady? Go! Open her up! The pelican opened his gigantic beak and immediately the policeman pounced upon the burglar who was crouching inside. They snatched his pistol away from him and dragged him out and put handcuffs on his wrists. Great Scott, shouted the chief of police, it's the Cobra himself. The, the who? The what? Everyone asked. Who's the Cobra? The Cobra is the cleverest and most dangerous cat burglar in the world, said the chief of police. He must have climbed up the drain pipe. The cobra can climb anything. My diamonds, cried, screamed the duchess. I want my diamonds. Where are my diamonds? Here they are cried the chief of police, fishing great handfuls of fishing great handfuls of jewels from the burglar's pockets. The, ch the Duchess was so overcome with the relief that she fell to the ground in a faint. When the police had taken away the fearsome burglar known as the Cobra, and the fainting Duchess had been carried into her house by her servants, the old Duke stood on the lawn with the giraffe, the pelican, the monkey, and me. Look, cried the monkey, that rotten burglar's bullet has made a hole in poor Pelly's beak. That's done it, said the pelican. Now it will 
will be any use for holding water when we need to clean the windows. Don't you worry about that, my dear Pelly, said the Duke. He patting him on the beak. My chauffeur will soon put a soon put a patch over it, the same way he mends the tires on the rolls. Right now we have far more important things to talk about than a little hole in a beak. We stood there waiting to see what the Duke was going to say next. Now listen to me, all of you, said the Duke. He said, those diamonds were worth millions, millions and millions and you have saved them. The monkey nodded, the giraffe smiled, and the pelican blushed. No reward is too great for you, for, for you. The duke went on, I am therefore going to make you an offer which I hope will give you a pleasure. I hereby invite the giraffe and the pally the, and the monkey to live on my estate for the rest of their lives. I shall give you my best and largest hay barn as, you pro, as your private home. Central heating, showers, a kitchen, and anything else you desire, for your comfort will be installed. In return, you will keep my windows clean and pick my cherries and my apples. If the pelican is willing, perhaps he will also give me a rhyme in his beak now and again. A pleasure, your grace, cried the pelican. Would you like a ride right now? Later, said the duke, I'll have one after tea. At this point, the giraffe gave a nervous little cough and looked up to the sky. Is there a problem? asked the Duke. If there is, do please tell me. I'd like to hear it. I don't like to sound ungrateful or pushy, murmured the giraffe. But we do have one very pressing problem. We are all absolutely famished. We haven't eaten for days. My dear giraffe, cried the Duke, how very thoughtless of me. Food is no problem around here. I'm afraid it is not quite as easy as all that, said the giraffe. You see, I myself happened to be... You don't, don't tell me, cried the Duke. I know it already. I am ex... I am an expert on animals of Africa. The moment I saw you, I knew you were no ordinary giraffe. You were of the drainy giraffe. Drainiest giraffe verity, are you not? You are absolutely right, your grace, said the giraffe. Said the giraffe. But the trouble with us is that we only eat. You don't have to tell me that either, cried the duke. I know perfectly well a drainage giraffe can eat only one kind of food. Am I not right in thinking the 
pink and purple flowers of the tinkle tinkle tree on your only diet. Yes, sighed the giraffe. And that's been my problem ever since I have arrived on these shores. That is no problem. All here at Hampshire's house, said the Duke. Look over there, my dear giraffe, and you will see the only plantation of the tinkle tinkle tree in the entire country. The giraffe looked. She gave a gasp of astonishment. And first she was so overwhelmed, she couldn't even speak. Great tray! Great tears of joy began running down her cheeks. Help yourself, said the Duke. Eat all you want. Oh my mess! Oh my sainted souls! gasped the giraffe. Oh my naked neck! I cannot believe what I am seeing. The next moment, she was galloping full speed across the lawns and whinnying with excitement. And the last we saw of her, she was burying her head in the beautiful pink and purple flowers that had blossomed on the tops of the trees all around her. As for the monkey, the duke went on, I think he will also be pleased with what I have offered. All my estate, there are thousands of giant nut trees. Nuts? cried the monkey. What kind of nuts? Walnuts, of course, said the duke. Walnuts, screamed the monkey. Not walnuts. You don't really mean walnuts. You're, you're pulling my leg. You're joking. You can't be serious. I must have heard wrong. There's a walnut tree right over there, the duke said, pointing. The monkey took off like an arrow and flew. And a few seconds later, he was high up in the branches of the walnut tree, cracking the nuts and guzzling what was inside. The leaf, that leaves only the pelly, said the duke. Yes, said the pelican, nervously, but I am afraid what I eat does not grow on trees. I only eat fish. Would it be too much trouble if I wondered if I were to ask for a reasonably fresh piece of haddock or cod every day. Haddock or cod, shouted the duke, spitting out the words, all as though it made a bad taste in his mouth. Cast your eyes, my dear Pelly, over to the south. The pelican looked across the ve the vast rolling east, and in the distance he was a he saw a great river. That is the river of hemp, cried the duke. The fi the finest salmon river in the whole Europe. Salmon. Screeched the pelican. Not salmon! You don't really mean salmon! It's full of salmon, the duke said. And 
and I own it. You can help yourself. Before he had finished talking, before he had finished speaking, the pelican was in the air. The duke and I watched him as he flew full speed towards the river. We saw him circle over the water. Then he dived and disappeared. A few moments later, he was in the air again, and he had a giant salmon in his beak. I stood on the lawn with the duke. I stood along. I stood alone with the duke on the lawn beside the great house. Well, Billy, he said, I'm glad they're all happy. But what about you, my lad? I am. I'm glad. But what about you, my lad? Uh, and. I'm wondering if you happened to have just one extra special little wish for yourself. If you do, I'd love you to tell me about it. There is a sudden, there was sudden tingling in my toes. It felt like. It felt as though something tremendous might be going to happen to me any moment. Yes, I murmured nervously. I do have one extra special little wish. And what might that be? Said the Duke in a kind voice. There is an old wooden house near where I live. I said, "It's called the Grubber, and a long time ago it used to be a sweet shop. I have wished and wished that one day somebody might come along and make it into a marvelous new sweet shop." All over again. Somebody cried the duke. What do you mean, somebody? You and I will do it. We'll do it together. We'll make it into the most wonderful sweet shop in the world, and you, my boy, will own it. Whenever the old duke got excited. His, his moustache started to bristle and jump about. Right now, they were jumping up and down so much. It looked as though he had a uh, looked as though he had a squirrel on his face. By God, sir! He cried. Waving his stick, I shall buy the place today. When we'll, then we'll get to work and have the whole thing ready in no time. You just wait and see. That sort of a sweet shop where we are going to make it out. We're going to make it out of this grubber place of yours. It was amazing how quickly things began to happen. After that, the there was no problem about buying the house because it was. Owned by the giraffe and the pony and the monkey, and they ins 
upon giving it to the Duke for nothing. The, then builders and carpenters moved in and rebuilt the whole inside so that once again it had floors. On all these floors they put together rows and rows of tall shelves and there were ladders to climb up to the highest shelves and baskets to carry what you bought. and fudge and nuggets began to began to fill in shelves. They came by airplane from very com from every country in the world. Most wild wonder wondrous things you could Eve ever imagine. There were gum twizzlers and fizzle nicklers from China, frog fro bubblers and spit sinklers from Africa tummy ticklers and gobwanklers from Fiji Islands and lip sucker, lip lickers and plush nuggets from the Land of Midnight Sun. For two whole weeks, the, the flood of boxes and sacks continued arrive. Continued to arrive. I could no longer keep track of all the countries they came from, but you can bet to yourself that as I unpacked each new bat and I sampled it carefully, I can, I can remember especially the giant wandoodle, wandoodles from Australia and every one with a huge prize with a red strawberry hidden in its crispy chocolate crust and electric fizz cocklers that made every hair on your head stand straight up is straight up one end one end as soon as you popped one into your mouth and there, and there were nib, nishnoblers, and gum, to, gum lotlers, and blue bubblers, and sherbet slurpers, and tongue rakers, and and as well as all this, there was a whole lot of splendid stuff from, from Greta Wonka Factory itself. For example, the famous Wild Wonka Rainbow Drops suck, suck them 
and you can spit in seven different colors. And his twist jaw, his stick jaw, talkative parents, and his mint jump jumps that will give the boy next door green teeth for a month. On the, on the grand opening day, I decided to all, allow all my customers to help themselves for free. And the place was so crowded, you could hardly, with children, you could hardly move. The television, the television, cameras, and newspaper were, reports were all there. And the old duke himself stood out on the road with my friend. The mouth and the giraffe and the penny and the monkey watched the marvelous scan. scan. I came out of the shop to join them for a moment, for a few moments, and I brought each, each of them a bag of extra special sweets as a present. To the Duke, because the weather was a little chilly, I gave, I gave some scarlet scratch drops to the, that had been sent to me from Iceland. The label said that they were gar the label said that they were guard net they were guaranteed the label said that they were guaranteed to make the persons who sucked them as warm as toast even if they were dark standing starch naked in the North Pool in midwinter. The moment the Duke popped one into his mouth, thick smoke came sh brushing, came gushing out of his old boy's nostrils. This, in such a common in such a quantity, in such a quantities that I thought his moustache were going up in flames. Terrific! He he cried, hopping about. Tremendous stuff! I told. I'll take a case of them home with me. To the giraffe I gave a bag of glumptious gobblers. The gobblers is an ex especially delicious sweet that is made with a that is made somewhere somewhere near Mecca and the moment you bit one it and the moment you bit into it all the perfumed juices of bar of Abrica go squirting down your gullet after the other, one after the other. 
is wonderful. Climbed the giraffe as she as she cast as she cast the lovely liquid flavor. Powder than all powdered all the way down her long, long throat is even better than my favorite pink and purple flowers. To the pelican, I gave a bag, a big bag of pillet, pishlet, pishlet, pishlet as your probably pishlets, pishlets as you probably know are bought by children who are unable to whistle and a turn whistle a turn as they walk along the street but long to but long to do so. They had a splendid traffic, a splendid effect upon the pelican for for a splendid effect for the pelican after he had put one in one of them into his beak and chewed it for a while, suddenly he started singing like a night, like a night, night taggle. This made his, his, him wildly excited because pelicans are not sing song bears. No pelican has ever been known to to whistle a turn before the monkey I gave a bag of devil of devil's drench as devil's drenches. There was small the small fairy black sweet that one is no allowed to to sell to children on their four years old when you have when you when you have sucked a devil's chair for a minute or so, you can set your breath, all breath alight, and below a huge column of fire, fire, blow. You can blow a huge column of fire 20 feet into the air. The Duke, the Duke and put a match to the monkey's breath and shouted, Blow monkey, blow a sheet of orange flames. Short short flames shot up high as the roof of the roof of the grammar house and it was wonderful I've got to leave you now I said I must go and look after this, the customers in the shop we must go too, said the giraffe. We have one hundred windows to clean before dark, I said.
then I said goodbye to the jewel. And then one by one I said goodbye to the three best friends I had ever had. Suddenly we all became very quiet. He looked as though he was about to cry as he sang me a little song of farewell. We have tears in our eyes as we wave our goodbyes. We so love, we so love being with you three. We three so do please, now then, come see us again, the giraffe and the penny and me. All we do is look at a page in this book, because that's where we will always be. No book ever ends when it's full of your friends, the giraffe and the penny and me.